the powers project all right got it on there all right ready yeah three two one and we're live russell how you doing today sir i'm doing good thank you uh, we have some nice weather here in oregon today <laughs> i bet it's nicer than ours it's it's awful hot here so <laughs> what could, what's the temperature there uh, it's in the 60s. Uh, it's been raining earlier in the week, but uh, it's in the 60s, moving toward the 70s. And um, that's good because I'm done with the rain. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have a dear friend who lives out there right across the border in Washington there. And uh, and she travels to Portland you know, on a regular basis <laughs> because I guess the way the taxes are, she can go over there and shop. Yep. And so, yep. uh, so she's a uh, she's very frugal like that. <laughs> so, oh yeah, uh, yeah. So she she always talks about the rain and she can't wait for it to stop. So yep. <laughs> well, I appreciate you joining me. Um, for those who don't know, um, you're a pastor of the church right. called uh, Rivers of Living Water United Pentecostal Church of Sandy, Oregon. Right. That is correct. Okay. Um, if you would. Uh, the reason why I asked you to be on the show is because I saw you featured in a segment on um, Now This News, which I saw on mm -hmm. Facebook, and there was, okay. they were interviewing you because you were at one of your events at a rally, and yeah. and I don't know who the guy was that was interviewing you, but obviously it was it had to do with um, there were, you had gay protesters because apparently you know yes. you talk about you know, gay issues when you talk about yeah. as well as many other things, which we'll delve into. Sure. And so when you were being interviewed, I, I got the sense that you weren't like some of the people I'd seen previously, like the, like the people from Westboro Baptist church who, who are just, you know, hateful people. I didn't get that sense from you, but there were some things that, you know, that were kind of, contradictory and so i wanted to have you on the show i wanted to talk to you and i wanted us to discuss these things and do so in a manner that where we're actually having a discussion not argument not a debate but a real discussion to maybe try to bridge that divide and see if we can come to some sort of understanding if mm -hmm. so that we can at least if nothing else respect one another's opinions mm -hmm. so that's why i asked you on the show um, yeah. so thank you for, for agreeing to be with me um sure it takes a lot of, you know, like some people don't understand how, how brave it t you have to be to, to do this because you never yeah. know what you're, what you're walking into sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> um, so being a Pentecostal, I don't know. Do you, do you take the Bible literally? Do you, the inter literal interpretation of the Bible? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. That helps. Now, I don't. The other thing I I really don't want to do. I mean, we might have to. We may end up doing a little bit, but I don't want to get back. I don't want to get into a whole lot of scriptures because okay. what happens is is that we end up coming down to interpretation of scripture sometimes. And so, you know, you mm -hmm. could take one scripture and have 10 people and 10 people will come up with 10 different interpretations of that one scripture. So while we may end up doing having to do that to some extent, I, I don't want to go tit for tat as far as, you know, well, the Bible says this and I go, well, the Bible says this and that sort of thing, because I don't think that's productive. So tell me where you stand, you know, that when you do these rallies, you, you talk about all different types of topics like child sex trafficking, healing from racism, patriotism, um, pro-life, you even talk about the election and, and law enforcement. Yeah. So, and, yeah. and, you talk about uh, homosexuals, obviously, because it's you know mm -hmm. it's a big thing in the Bible. So tell me, what is it like at one of your rallies? What is your what? Why are you there? What do you what are you attempting to do? Sure. So in July, I believe it was of last year, um, the general superintendent, which is like the um, highest ranking official that we elect in our fellowship uh, sent out an email to all of us uh, that are pastoring asking us to hold a rally on August the 8th 
was the eighth or the ninth. I think it was the eighth. Um, and if we could in front of our city hall for the purpose of standing for religious freedom, there's been a lot of concern about that subject. And so um, I had never done a rally like that. So I contacted our city. I said, we want to do what is called a prayer, faith, and freedom rally. It is focused on speaking about the need for religious freedom. In addition to that, he mentioned that it would be good if we made it clear that we stand for law enforcement. And so we spoke about that as well. So after that particular uh, rally, there were people that asked, are we going to have more rallies? And, you know, this is at the time when so much has been happening in the country in 2020. And I think there were a lot of people, Kurt, that um, were glad to see a church coming forward uh, in our community. And so we began to have rallies basically very regularly. And I don't want this to sound critical or negative. There were a lot of people that were frustrated that their pastors were not speaking on subjects that are relevant to right now and what's going on in our country and in our world. And I was not trying to become a celebrity. I was not trying to become a politician. I was not trying to make our events into a spectacle. My true intent was to speak to our day, to what's going on, um, without, I'm going to say that filter of, is this going to make some people view myself and the church as something out of bounds? Like, you guys aren't supposed to be talking about these things. You're not supposed to talk about things that are considered secular. Well, our spiritual life guides our secular life. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so I did not feel, and I don't feel that it is wrong to speak publicly about things that are of concern to our country and our world. So we addressed, as you mentioned, a lot of different subjects. Some of them are in fact political, social, cultural. It's trying to address the whole person, the, the whole experience of what we live. So that was really the, the, the starting point. When we got to the point to where the weather was really bad, we stopped having the rallies publicly out there in the square because of the rain and all of that. But then when the weather cleared up, the earlier part of this year, we went out again and we set up canopies in the, the plaza. And... Um, and, you know, continue to invite people. Our, our primary way of promoting it was through Facebook. I, I would post on numerous Facebook groups here locally, um, just inviting people. And so people began to come again. And um, Russell, then I'm sorry, can I stop you just for a second? Because before we get on, because I want to get on to that. But before we do, I do have a question that popped up in my head. In all the topics that you talked about, you said that you also talk about political stuff. 
And that's one of the issues I've had with churches recently where they've started talking about political things when mm -hmm. there's supposed to be a separation from church and church and state. And, mm -hmm. and they shouldn't, at least in my opinion and my understanding is that churches never were to tell you who to vote for or what side to pick. And that, you know, and I've seen that in many churches where the preacher stands up and says, if you're not for, this candidate or this candidate, then you're then you're on the wrong side, and so it's it's. I almost go well. You don't deserve to have that distinction of being a church any longer if you're going to start preaching about politics, and there, you shouldn't get that exemption if you're going to teach uh, preach about politics. How I mean, and that's just my opinion. So, what is your opinion on that? Mm -hmm. So, speaking about moral concepts, moral principles, and teachings of the Word of God. And comparing that to platforms that a candidate may have is not out of bounds, in my opinion. Um, the sanctity of life is just that. It's sacred. And so having comments about things that are moral and comparing that to the comments of an individual that is running for an office saying on those issues, this is my stand, he's taking a moral stand. Or she's taking a moral stand. So it's not out of bounds to speak morally about those things. I'm not talking economic policy, yada, yada, yada. I'm, I'm focused on the moral, the moral um, specifics. So don't you think you should, that, that preachers should focus on speaking about those specifics, not naming you know, not naming one candidate or the other, but saying, these are what we believe in. If you believe in these, then you need to make sure whatever candidate you vote for believes in this as well, rather than being so like direct with it. Like, you know, saying yep. this is the guy who you need to vote for. You know, I think that people should be, should have a right to make that choice themselves. Mm -hmm. and figure that of out course. Themselves. Yeah, of course. I, I don't disagree with what you just said. I also think that there are times when directness is appropriate. Um, the scripture shows us a lot of examples where the spiritual leaders spoke to the governmental leaders directly. So I say I agree with what you said, but I do believe that there are times when I am comfortable speaking direct about things or positions that people hold. Okay. Because, right. you know. I understand. I, I, I do. I understand where you're coming from as well. So. Okay. I, I will tell you this, though. It's hard to talk about politics and 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 morals because <laughs> there's so little of it in our political system that <laughs> yep it's hard to yep. fight. but anyway so the weather got better and yeah. you started holding rallies again mm -hmm. yes and so what and, and i know this phrase has been um misused but because a phrase is misused doesn't mean that there isn't a proper way to use it or that it's true. And the phrase I'm talking about is I really felt God speak to my heart about the subject matter for these rallies. Okay. And so what I felt for January was to speak about we're still in America. And then in February, 
we had two rallies and I can't even remember now the first rally. The second rally though, was an open invitation to the LGBTQ community to come to the plaza and have an open discussion with us about sexual potential versus sexual purpose. So you reached out the, to the LGBTQ. I did. Okay, so I absolutely did. So who who did you reach out specifically? Because what I wanted to do, and like I said, one of the reasons for this show is that I want us to um, to attempt to bridge the divide and 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 have an understanding because I think on my side we tend to call everything homophobic and that people hate us if they don't agree with us and I go that's not the case I you, people don't have to hate you to not agree with you and I don't right. think I don't think the majority of people hate gay people they just go okay this is my belief and i believe it's wrong but i don't hate you for it now there mm -hmm. like i mentioned earlier people like from the westboro baptist church mm -hmm. who are who are filled with hatred that's all it is it's there's no love compassion or understanding in their teachings whatsoever and that's what i found different about you um and i and i know that you in in the interview i saw you in it said you said that you had reached out to them now I reached out to Sandy, Oregon to find LGBT. They don't have one. They have one in Portland. And so I, that's what I wanted to find the specifics. Like, did you just reach out to a few people who happened to be gay who didn't really have any say so in the gay community or? Right. So I used the exact same format for that rally as I had for every previous rally, which was just promoting it on the local Facebook groups that I had been promoting it on. And there were people in this area that knew about our previous rallies that every time I would post, um, there would be comments, right? So when I posted about that rally in particular, in the exact same way, um, those same people were aware um, i did not contact a specific individual or individuals i just promoted it like i had been what happened was there was no one that came let me rephrase that there was somebody a couple of people maybe that pulled up in their car on the edge of the plaza and stayed for just a little bit and then they pulled away um, what we did the next month, and, and I'm just being upfront, I felt to reach out in the same way that we've been reaching out to the community previously to the LGBTQ community. Then I was like, okay, so March, I felt now celebrate the natural heterosexual family. It was just simply a change of subject matter or change of theme. When I posted that in the exact same way, it went off the rails. It went berserk. Can I tell you? Um, okay, go right. ahead. So, you're right, so one of the things I think that that Christians don't understand or don't get is that for for eons, gay people have been vilified. They've been demonized. They've been called everything. They've been ostracized. I mean, they've they've been made to to feel like they're less than. Told that they're you know that they're going to hell. That you know, I mean, just I, I don't know if, if you can imagine just being beaten down constantly and being made to feel like you're less than human. So when these people start to to gain some rights and they start to to exert themselves when they hear things like the celebration of the natural heterosexual family basically what they're reading is you're saying heterosexuality is natural homosexuality is not and they don't mm -hmm. believe that and they take offense to that because you're saying this is good this is not good and that may be your belief but that's how that's what they're saying it's like you can have your belief you can believe that you know, the heterosexual family is the, the nucleus. That's the family that you should strive for. But that's your belief. And to say, you know, to put it in a way that makes them seem like they're less than, 
they would take offense to that. And, and so it's probably just the wording more than anything else. And it was probably innocent on your part without realizing that. And, and most street people don't understand because it's not something they've ever had to deal with, but it would be, if you could imagine that 90% of the world is gay and 10% of the world is heterosexual. And then all of a sudden, you know, you see something where, you know, come out and celebrate the natural homosexual family and you're and you're straight and you're like, wait a minute, what does that mean? I'm not natural. I'm not, you know, there's something wrong with me. And, <laughs> and so there's, you know, there's that disconnect, if you will. And that, and that's where that animosity comes from, from deep from within because of everything that's been, that's happened to them over the ages, you know, and being oppressed and kept down. And that's, and I think that's what you saw come out. I'm not justifying anything. I'm just saying mm -hmm. that gives you kind of an understanding why you might've seen that backlash in that particular thing. Mm -hmm. I would not disagree. And one of the things that was a very sensitive issue was the word natural yes <laughs> that's exactly and so right. yeah so and 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 okay my point was that is how humanity continues to exist it's the natural union of a man and a woman that produces children and God's plan is for there to be a Adam and an Eve with children. That is what I was saying. It is a natural heterosexual family. That's why the next generation and the next generation even exists. So that may I interject something here just, uh, yeah. just to give you a different perspective. So I understand, again, I understand where you're coming from, but I would argue that homosexuality is just as natural as heterosexuality. We see it in nature throughout nature with over a thousand species. We see homosexuality within over a thousand different animal species. And if anything, I look at it as like, is this part of nature where, where it's part of nature's population control? So, you know, it, from preventing a new species from overpopulating. And, and the thing is, that, as you said, it's, you know, you call it natural because it's about a man and a woman and that's how the world gets populated. And that's, and I, and I completely agree, but you also realize that not every man and woman who gets married has children and they don't right. have on having children. So, right. right. To, so as far as marriage goes, it's not, it shouldn't be relegated to just, just people who only want to get married and have children. Otherwise, there would be heterosexual couples out there who wouldn't be allowed to get married either if that was a prerequisite. No, and that wasn't, I wasn't saying that because okay. there are people, there are people who cannot have kids. Right. Or choose not to have kids. They just uh, Right. Okay. So again, I was, I was focused on saying, here is God's plan here. That that's why I've used this phrase many times, sexual potential versus sexual purpose. Now, and I want, and I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to get into that. I want you to explain yeah. what you yeah. mean by that sexual potential versus sexual purpose. Yeah. Sexuality is natural. Absolutely. There isn't anything unnatural about God's design as far as making a man with a sexuality and a woman with a sexuality and a natural desire or sexuality. It, it is God design. So potential is 
the issue that really brings into play all of the various ways that we can express our sexuality. Does potential equal purpose? Purpose is, here's here's why I gave you potential, so that you could fulfill this purpose. So when you look at Adam and Eve, they had the potential to fulfill the purpose, being husband and wife, having children. And again, I recognize not every couple can at this point, but I'm trying to go back to God's design. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and re- really relatively speaking, I would, I would venture to say that the majority of heterosexual couples are capable of having children. Oh yeah. And, so. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so when you take the potential for sex and you view it that it has a purpose i'm not going to say that having children is the only part of that purpose but it is a very core part of that purpose intimacy affection care vulnerability commitment, trust, kindness, serving. There's a lot that goes into sexuality when it follows purpose. To bring, Scripture said, uh, the two become one. It's not just a, a numerical thing. It is also an emotional uh, soul thing. And so I would, I would say that sexuality is intended to give pleasure. And some people, honestly, Kurt, reduce sexuality to that level and say, that's it. That's the purpose, <laughs> just pleasure. Especially, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, especially young people. I mean, especially when right. you're starting out, that's what it is to them. And you're yes. right. So, you know, sexuality is all those things. But I don't know that you understand that you have those same exact things in gay relationships. And, and, oh, and so, so the potential. Right. And so the p- potential. Right. But they also serve their purpose because I think here's the thing. When we when we make the mistake of believing that everyone is supposed to say this, this have the same purpose. I don't believe that. Just like your your purpose is to be a pastor. I would make mm-hmm. a lousy pastor. I don't I think if everyone said, "Oh, you should become a pastor." I go, "Why? Because Russell's a pastor? He's much better at than I would ever be." So, it we have different purposes in this life. And I don't I and I think it's, it's presumptuous of us to assume that we would know what any individual's purpose is that God, you know, if you believe in God, that God gave them because maybe they are serving their purpose because I can tell you personally, and, and I know this is something, and, and I would like to, if I can express one thing to you today, um, at, at, because you are a pastor and because you do have pull over your congregation and they do listen to you. I would like for you to take this away. I was married and I had children. Okay. I was told at a very early age when I knew I was gay and, you know, it wasn't something I even wanted to admit, you know, if I, it, honest to goodness, I mean this with all my heart. I did things, you know, like I fasted for five, for five full days with no food, no water, no nothing. I prayed to God on my knees countless times. I begged him to make me straight. I wanted to be anything but gay. I remember in, sitting in the church grass one time in, in the, in the, in the uh, outside, and I remember thinking if there was one pill that could make a person go from being gay to straight, I would, do, I would take it. 
I don't care if I had to beg, borrow, steal. I don't care if it cost a million dollars. I would find a way to get that pill because the last thing I wanted to be was different from everybody else. I wanted to be like everybody else. Now you couldn't pay me a million dollars to take that pill, but back then you could. And so I did things that, that, that were harmful to my health that, that could have been harmful to my health because I wanted to be straight that bad. So when I went to, you know, my clergy and, and we discussed this, they said, look, you keep doing what you're supposed to do. You keep praying, you keep fasting, paying your tithes, all the stuff that a good Christian would do. And God will take this from you. Get married, date women, have children. It will be taken from you. Well, lo and behold, it wasn't. And so what happens is you get married and you have children. So now when these desires and these innate urges never dissipate and you finally give into it because that's who you really are, now it doesn't just affect my life. It now affects a, a, a woman, children, their families, your families, everybody in, that's included in that. And so now it's not just me who suffers from my choices. Mm -hmm. There's a slew of other people, innocent people, who are going to suffer because of my choices. And that's exactly what happened. And I think when pastors and preachers and they give this advice, just pray. This isn't, I can tell you with all honesty. This is not a choice. Nobody, at least not in our in our day and age, nobody would have chosen to be gay. I remember hearing someone, I, I want to say it was Pat Robertson or, or one of the others uh, famous ones that said, the reason why people are gay is because they want attention. And I just laughed. I go, yes, I wanted attention so bad that I hid in the closet for 40 years. That's how much attention I wanted. It was just a ridiculous statement to make because so many people are in the closet. And when you aren't able to express who you truly are, this is what happens, is that other innocent people get brought into it and hurt in the process. So your description of your, your struggle is absolutely real. And I don't deny it because we all have issues with sexuality we all do and that's where i think many times people feel that the church should not speak about these things because it's like so personal it is so private um that it makes people uncomfortable. You know, we all kind of get it. You know, we're going to, you know, get married, have kids. We know how kids are made, but we're not going to talk about sexuality very much because this is church and we're not going to. God talks about sexuality a lot in the Bible. And that is why I believe the various sexual potentials are addressed in the Bible. He speaks about adultery. He speaks about fornication. He speaks about bestiality. He speaks about rape, incest. He speaks about things that are horrible. And how come they're even happening? Because we have the potential sexually to do those things is that our purpose no it is not my purpose or your purpose to be a rapist a pedophile whatever right. but are there people are there people doing that yes so if the church is silent about those things it's almost like uh well, we just don't talk about those things. So you don't deal with it. You don't focus on it. And when you don't focus on it and bring it up, then it gives room for it to just go whichever direction. So I know the Bible says that I have to crucify the flesh daily. 
that's not just dealing with my desires to be greedy or my desires to lie or my desires to cheat you out of money or whatever. It deals with my sexuality as well. And sexuality is such a core part of who we are. If we're honest, it is on our mind so much every day. At least. That's what <laughs> it is. Yeah, I mean, it, every day. It Without a doubt. It, it, that, yeah. And I think that's why God speaks about sexuality so much. So when you describe your struggles, okay, I'm not trying to say that I know what that man that spoke to you, you know, was thinking uh, completely or whatever. I do. I know how I view what you described you me every person needs the help of god prayer yes word of god yes faith yes the indwelling of the spirit of god to enable us and to empower us yes me turning from those things that i realize God says this is not his purpose or plan for me. Yes, that's me. There's the God part. There's the me part. And I hear you saying you struggled. I hear that. I'm not denying that. I'm saying we do struggle with our sexual potential. And that is why we need God's help so much within that area of our life. So what would you say? I'm going to, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, okay. I'm just going to jump to this point. I said this at the rally. There was a lesbian lady that my wife and I have known for many years that lives here in Sandy. She spoke at the counter protest. She's a lawyer. She she is part of a homosexual, lesbian, an LGBTQ affirming church in Portland. She is a minister in that church. She came across the street to our event while I was preaching. She stood about 10 feet away from me up front to show people, and she said this, she, she wanted people to see a lesbian woman standing in front of them who was not afraid to stand in front of them, who was not intimidated to stand in front of them. And when I got to this certain portion of the message, I said this, and I mean this, I said, I'm saying this to Kim, my friend, and to whoever else will listen. I don't deny that same-sex couples can love each other. I don't deny that they can have affection and kindness and commitment for each other. But love does not qualify what God endorses. What qualifies what God endorses is righteousness. And when we find scripture that tells us what is and is not righteous, that's the qualifier. Because she was representing and does represent, as many others, that love is the issue. I don't deny love, but love isn't the qualifier. The Bible says men love darkness, and they didn't come to the light because they love darkness. It is possible to say that there are people that love evil. So love can't be the qualifier for what God endorses. It must be righteousness. So I don't, I don't deny that there are committed same-sex couples, loving same-sex couples, 
kind, affectionate, et cetera, et cetera. But I have to take the view that love doesn't trump or surpass righteousness. Okay. So, That's where I'm coming from. Right. Okay. And I, and I understand that. And I, I respect that position. Let me, let me add to that though. When I finally came out and one of the things I've always been taught is that if you are confused, it's of the devil. It's only when, when things become clear that that's of God, because God will not confuse you. I am going to tell you, I mean, it was, it was an epiphany to me. And this is what my experience was. I'm not saying this is what it was for anyone else. I'm saying this was my experience. Mm -hmm. Is that as soon as I accepted who I was and came out, it was like the weight of the world was lifted off of my shoulders. And I remember thinking, why? Like, why? And I heard a voice in my head. Now, you call me crazy, whatever, but I heard a voice in my head. Did it ever occur to you that the things you were asking me to do were not the things that I wanted for you? And it was at that moment I realized that what God wants for one person isn't what he wants for everybody. Now, you know, you can, I believe there are certain rules. You know, we have the Ten Commandments, for instance, that say you shall not do these things. Those are hard-pressed rules that... I think probably applied to everybody, you know, um, but I, there's, there's certain things in the Bible because again, uh, I will say this, the Bible is, is um, loosely interpreted in, interpreted. I will say that, especially if you follow the King James version, they, they took some, they took some extreme liberties and in, in, in the translation of Hebrew to English and, and Greek to English. And I studied this for, for a few years. You know, I, I've gone over scriptures where, you know, where it talks about uh, the Virgin Mary. The direct translation from Greek to English is not that Mary is a virgin. It's that she wasn't married. Now, you and I both know that's, that's completely different. <laughs> or it can be very different. It may not be, but it, it certainly could be. And so, when we have these, when we have these translations that are that have been certain liberties have been taken with, we can go through the scriptures, and that's why I said I really don't want to get into the scripture thing too much because I could I could argue with you all day about how you know how certain you know, scriptures, especially in in uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, how these things were were not translated properly, and this is what I think it means, and you can say, well, I think it means this, and so it really doesn't serve a purpose. But I do believe that, you know, that you're right. We have a, we each have a purpose, but I don't think our purposes are all the same. And I, and I, and I know that for a fact, I know that personally for myself and how I felt. And it's not, you know, it's not for me to testify before you that I'm right and you're wrong or you're right and I'm wrong. It's, it's to say there are differences. And, and one of the thing is, is that when you talk about homosexuality, you, you, whether you realize this or not, you automatically went to pedophilia, bestiality, and other you know, uh, abnormalities. And homosexuality is not. It is certainly, you know, I can just, you know, like I said, when people ask me, well, you know, why did you choose to be gay? I go, I never chose. I, I, it was not something I ever wanted. Just like you didn't choose to be straight. No one can, re not one guy I've ever asked this to go, when was how old were you when you decided to be straight? And they're like, "What? I, I didn't yeah, exactly. I didn't decide to be gay. As, as sure as, as you it wasn't even a question in your mind as to that you were straight. I knew I was gay. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was called, and I didn't know what it m meant. I just knew I was different from other people. But it was never a question in my mind as far as is this who I am. I knew it was who I was. So I think if we take a more understanding approach to it. And, and if straight people could understand that there's, you know, it's just not a choice. I know that it's easier to believe that because it makes it look like God didn't make a mistake. And I'm telling you, he didn't. Gay people are not a mistake. Let me, let me try to add something there. Mm -hmm.
there are straight guys that view sex with women as their only interest. They don't have any interest in anyone other than a female. Right. And they pursue sexual encounters only with females in what is called fornication. So typically, we understand fornication to be sex between two unmarried people. Okay. And a lot of times we think of that as consensual. Somebody goes to the bar, hooks up, goes home, has sex. But that's not the only category of fornication. There are guys that pursue women or girls or teenagers or elderly women, whatever, because that is what they naturally want. They do not want marriage. They don't want to be tied to one woman. I have I I know that there are people that straight guys that would never have sex with a man, but they would have sex with as many women as they possibly could. (laughs) It's just like it's like that. That's their goal in life. Okay, how many how many women can I have other straight guys? and, And let me say something else. Those kind of men. They, they, and I'm not trying to classify, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm trying to say sexuality is so huge in our lives. That guy would say, that's, that's what I've always felt. That's what I've always been drawn to. Uh, and, and when you bring up that, I said, bestiality, pedophilia, in there are men, and, and I'm talking more about men. I'm not saying it can't happen with women, but there are men that their drive, all they're thinking about is how can I get another victim? I want sex as a rapist. I want sex as a pedophile. I want sex with animals. It's, and, and for as long as they can remember that's been their force of, of sex drive the sex drive that's that's what they've sought that's what they've wanted struggled with it and done it struggled with it and done it and then just became it so i'm i'm not trying to only say when when you mentioned abnormal that i made these abnormal references i'm i'm saying that's potential sexual potential to be something other than what God's purpose was. So I, I, I can understand how there can be a person who in an incestuous relationship, I talked to a man one time. He said, you don't understand. Incest has been in my family forever. My family culture is incest. So that affected him. It it put within him that tendency, that that drive, that, that potential to express his situation. And so I'm 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 just classifying I'm classifying all of us with potential. And I didn't mean for you to understand me to say that homosexuality is 
like bestiality. Well, that's why homosexuality, I- bestiality, pedophilia, fornication, rape, but it's all under that classification. And, and I don't and, and, and I don't preach only that homosexuality or lesbianism is a sin. I don't only preach that because the Bible doesn't only preach that. Okay, so here's I so here's a question for you. And again, I knew you weren't in, that's why I, I brought it up because I knew you didn't mean to lump it in as as you would with those. And so that's why I said something because I, I know that's not what intended, but I know how listeners are going to hear it. So I wanted to clear, I want you to be able to clarify that. Okay. So you have 10% of the population roughly is what we, I guess it's estimated at that 10% of the population are homosexuals. And yet whenever you, you or any other pastor or, or preacher goes out and has rallies or events, homosexuality and abortion seem to be the two biggest topics. I would mm-hmm. say, okay, if your if your purpose is to serve your congregation is is to help them live better lives wouldn't you be better served to focus on things like divorce since there's far more people who are married and get divorced than there are homosexuals so but we never hear about rallies that talk about divorce and i and because and this is my belief and you can correct me if i'm wrong because it points the finger at the very congregation that you're preaching to. It's much easier to, to find flaw, uh, fault and flaws in people that they're, they're not like. But if you were to oh. turn the, the, you know, the, the finger on them, they'd, they would be up in arms about it. They don't want to hear about divorce and, and, what, and how divorce is a sin. Because yes. you know, over 50% of the marriages in this country end in divorce. That's right. You know, and yet it's a sin. But we never hear anyone talk about that. I, I did specifically bring that into the last two rallies. You're right. And, and I spoke about where God says to a woman, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That verse right there really is saying, wives, voluntarily cooperate with your husbands. Make that choice that you're going to bear the responsibility of the marriage with him voluntarily, just like you voluntarily submit to the Lord and carry that burden of living that way to the Lord. And then he hammers men. Men, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Love your wife. If a man who loves his wife is loving himself, I mean, he hits men hard on here is how you treat your wife. Here is how you live out with your wife this purpose. And and you're right. The divorce rate is horrendous because of the day and age that we live in, Kurt, where commitment is such a shallow word. I mean, dude, the, 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 I've been, okay, I'm 59 years old. I've been married to the same woman the whole time I've been married. I don't even remember now. I think, when did we get married? I think it was at 82. We, it, we're, we're like 38 years of marriage or whatever it is. Okay. You think we've had it smooth the whole time? No way, Jose. Can I ask you a question? It, might get you in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Should I wait? <laughs> I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll, I'll do it after the show. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say this. Let me just say this. Sure. Commitment is not easy. It's not. Commitment. It costs. It costs. And, 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 and I'm not trying to throw this on you. You described your background. What I'm saying is in general. Okay. In general. Commitment equals when it's convenient. It's like, it's almost like, I'm not going to go to McDonald's because Wendy's is more convenient or Wendy's is more convenient than McDonald's or 
and I'm not, I know that's an oversimplification, but really we have a culture that is so shallow, that is so instant gratification oriented, that it's like the first time that the couple has a disagreement, then it's like, well, wait a minute, this is supposed to be what I am comfortable with. And it's not convenient for me to work through this spat with you. So I'm just going to blow up and leave the house. I'm going to go back to my friends. I'm, and that becomes a pattern that grows. And, and, and the lack of commitment deteriorates even further. And so divorce becomes the go-to because of the shallowness of commitment in our culture, in the individuals. And, and so you're, you're right as far as why isn't there more preaching about divorce being an issue? There needs to be, there should be, we do speak about that. And well, what I'm saying is it, that should be a bigger, to me, that should be a bigger issue because it's a, it's a, at least according to Christianity and the Bible, it's a much bigger problem. It, the, the amount of divorce that's going on compared to the amount of gay people we have, it, you know, it, you look at the problem and you go, when it, when it affects Christians, I would say if you're preaching to your, to your congregation, they need to hear more about, hey, divorce is a sin. Unless, mm-hmm. unless your spouse has cheated on you, you divorcing mm-hmm. someone and getting married to someone else, you've committed adultery. And adultery mm-hmm. is one of the top ten commandments. There's one of the big mm-hmm. things that you're not supposed to do, absolutely not do for, for everyone. Um, yeah. And, would, you know, we live in a – you're right, though. We live in a throwaway society. Where every you know we get a new phone every every two, couple of years we get a new car every few years we get we get if we don't if it breaks we don't even fix it there are no more TV and and VCR repair shops there's no more yeah. repairs you know it's like you just go buy a new one and so if they, like you said once it once it's we think it's broken it's like throw it out go get a new one yeah so and that's yeah. part of part of the issue of why there is so much divorce but I think talking about something like that. Is mm-hmm. is of of great more of a more a greater importance than bringing up homosexuality. That seems like a go to, and that's and I guess that's what bothers me. It's like it's always a go to for everyone to to get people behind them and go, oh yeah, we're against the gays, you know. And it's like, mm-hmm. why? It, it it really doesn't affect you. So, and that's mm-hmm. my question. It's like, if it doesn't affect people, why should they care? Okay, because. I, okay, the, the purpose, uh, according to the Word of God, a purpose for ministry is to be a watchman on the wall, to speak. What you, the, the purpose of the watchman on the wall was to guard for the city, to look on the landscape and see what is coming. What is coming to the gate of this city, to the walls of the city? Is it dangerous or is it friendly? Is it bad or is it good? Now, while I understand what the job is of a minister, yeah, I think what happens is some ministers, I'm not saying you, I'm saying some ministers, what happens is they take it too far. So your your whole job is to deliver the message and say, this is what mm-hmm. God thinks, this is what God feels. For many of them, it's it's like that's not enough. It's as almost as if they have to force you to live the way they want you to live and and do what they tell you to do. And as far as I have been taught, God let us come to this earth with free will. So while, yes. while you delivered the message, if I don't accept it, you you did your job. You know, your your job is done. You don't need to keep preaching to me any longer because I got your message and I said, yeah, it's not for me. You know, so at what point? Do you think that enough is enough? Like, you know, again, if you can imagine being part of a group where if someone's always feel like it always feels like they like, do you eat meat? Oh yeah. Okay. Have you ever had vegans just sit there and tell you about how, how bad it is to eat meat? And they just keep, no. asking, keep asking. I'm like, listen, you go, you know, you go eat your plants. I'm good. <laughs> you know, I get your message. I don't agree yeah. with it, but I'm good. And I kind of feel right. that way, being gay, that, you know, that the same thing happens. 
Yeah. So, okay. I'm going to try to pull in this idea uh, of, of first amendment. I'm thankful that we have first amendment rights and freedoms in this country. There's a lot of places. And I don't believe that Americans truly appreciate this. They there's a lot of places. There's a lot of places where you don't have freedom of speech, but we do. And so, okay. Because we have freedoms of religion, freedom of speech, freedoms of um, the press, freedom to redress our government with grievances, all of those things, we are blessed. And so then scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So if I'm if I'm a watchman on the wall and I'm saying, hey, here comes something that we need to be concerned about, or here is something that you need to be watching for. That I'm blessed to be able to say that because of First Amendment freedoms in this country. So it may, okay, you're, when a person hears it, you're right. They have the free to, will to choose to believe it or to not believe it. And, and, okay, and this is one thing I didn't understand. I really genuinely do not understand this. Whenever the comments on the posts are like, stop cramming your religion down our throat. I'm not cramming nothing down nobody's throat. I'm just simply saying we're having a rally. If you choose to come, okay, you can come. You don't have to come. I'm not coming to your door. I'm not, you know, dragging you out of your house. I, I, we, okay, freedom of speech. They, the, you can have as many gay rallies as you want to have. Freedom of speech. You can have whatever kind of event to speak whatever you want to speak. If I'm not mistaken, is it the month of June that's Gay Pride Month? Yes. How did that even happen? So, How did that? Because uh, I'm not going to talk over you, but but honestly, it came about because of freedom of speech. Right. Okay. Okay. So, so a month and... It, that is as much of an American right, freedom, liberty, as for us to have a rally celebrating the natural heterosexual family. Well, let me, if I may, let me touch on both uh, on two topics. One is I agree with you one hundred percent. Freedom of speech is is being it's being attacked. And it needs to stop. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and unfortunately, at this point in time, it's being attacked by the left. And I'll say that because I am on the left and I see it mm -hmm. and I go, this is wrong. I don't care if you disagree with someone's viewpoints or not for you to take away their their ability to say what what they want to say because you don't like it mm -hmm. is wrong. It's just wrong. Now, I will say this, the religious right years ago was doing the same thing to the people on the left in particular gay people trying to shut them down every way they could they would you know they would minimize what they had to say they would demonize what they had to say they would assassinate their characters they would do every they would pull every trick out of the book to try to silence them and they mm -hmm. would even try to legislate it they're still trying to legislate it in places like tennessee mm -hmm. where you're not even allowed to have the word gay in textbooks you're not allowed to talk about gay homosexuality and in, in, in sex ed, it, why? It's a thing. It's not made up. It's not, you're not indoctrinating anyone. You're just simply saying these are the different types of sexes that you, that, that take place in nature. And yet they're trying to legislate that so that we can't be heard. And, and I don't care if it's, whether it's, whether it's the right trying to silence the left or the left trying to silence the right, they're both wrong. It's that simple. <laughs> And I understand where you're saying, you know, where, where you have your rallies and, and people are like, why are you trying to cram this down our throats? Because, you know, it's very much like when, you know, when I would, I would take a walk out of the park and I hold my boyfriend's hand and, you know, no one ever said this to me directly, but I've heard these things said, why are you trying to flaunt your sexuality in front of me? And I mm -hmm. go, how is it that if I walk around the park with holding my boyfriend's hand, that's flaunting my sexuality. But if you walk around the park holding your, your, your girlfriend's hand, that's okay. It's a double mm -hmm. standard. And so, but again, as we, as you and I both know, hip hypocrisy isn't you know limited to one side or the other. <laughs> so, right. 
right? <laughs> so it's, unfor- I, I, you know, it's unfortunate. I've said this um, at, at at least one of the rallies. Censorship is the death of freedom. Exactly. Agreed. It is. So, so like right now, you and I view our sexual purpose. We're not on the same page. I'll just say it that way. Right. Right. I don't agree with, right. I don't agree with homosexuality. I don't believe that it's endorsed by the Bible, but you and I are not trying to act as though you don't have the right to have your podcast and I don't have the right to host a rally. We're in a country where we're blessed to be able to voice what we believe. And that is huge. That's huge. And censorship says, we don't like what you're saying, so we're not going to let you say it. That is communism. Right. And, and, and my, you'll get no argument out of me. I mean, none. In fact, I will say this. We don't have the same, the same viewpoints on homosexuality, obviously. We also don't have the same viewpoints on Christianity. I don't see mm-hmm. Christianity the way you do. Now, I also mm-hmm. don't see it as this, you know, it's funny how in this country, we, again, the hypocrisy of it, say anything about a Muslim or Islam and you're <laughs> Islamophobic, but you can yeah. bash a Christian all day long and nobody's going to say anything. Now, yeah. I'm no fan of Christianity, honestly, because I think that many of the problems that we have in this world throughout history have been because of Christianity. Now, I'm not saying that it's all Christians' faults, because obviously it's not. I think there's a, a lot of good Christians out there who, who have great intentions, and they mean well, and they do well on top of that. They do well, mm-hmm. and they live the kind of life that they that that they purport to live. Like, they, they're not hypocrites, mm-hmm. you know? Um, unfortunately there's a, there's a lot of them. And, and again, it's like, if I were to take, I shouldn't mention their names or not. I'll, I'll do it. The hell with it. <laughs> you take people like, uh, Joel Osteen and these guys who just are megalomaniacs as far as making money and, mm-hmm. and, and the way they preach and the things that they preach and how they go about it as if it's a business instead of, you know, instead of someone like you who's who's out on the on the streets and you're doing what you believe is the right thing, there's mm-hmm. there's those those charlatans who who give Christianity a bad name. There are Christians who give Christianity a bad name who always want to judge everybody else, point their finger at everybody else. And you know, and I would I always go, do you you know, again, I'm not a, a scholar when it comes to scripture, mm-hmm. but I do know Matthew seven five that talks about, you know, removing the uh, the the um what is it? The yeah, the, the beam out of your own eye. <laughs> yeah, so you can see clearly, you know, and and yeah. I see too many of them who are too like they go, I love God. What I see is they they're compassionate and understanding towards people who are just like them. But if you differ mm-hmm. in opinion, they have no time for you. And that's not Christ-like to me. So mm-hmm. I think Christianity has its its own issues, and it it really should clean its own house, basically, as Matthew would say, clean your own house before you start worrying about everybody else. But with that being said, again, I know that all Christians are not bad people. I don't, I don't think the majority of them are bad people. I think the majority of them do try to live a good life. And uh, it's unfortunate. We all have, no matter what group you belong to, there's always going to be a bad element, you know, related Mm -hmm. That's going to be part of that group, whether you like it or not. And so, um, and so, like I said, I don't think it's fair that Christianity gets bashed the way it does easily mm-hmm. without any without any kickback. No one says, "Hey, you can't talk about Christians like that." <laughs> you know? And so, I see where Christians sometimes, you know, they'll go, "There's a war on Christianity," and I, and you know, for someone like me, I kind of chuckle. I go, "Look." you guys have had your way pretty much for 2000 years. It's hard to say that they're, you know, that to start crying when you, because you're not getting everything that you used to get. You, you've been the oppressors and the abusers for, for ever and ever. And now when those oppressors and abusers push back, you're saying there's a war in Christianity. You know, I don't think there's a war. I think that people just got tired of, of, of 
being put down and now they're fighting back and that's what you see. And again, this is obviously my viewpoint from, from this, mm-hmm. side, but I've been on both sides and, and that's why I can say, I know there are good people out there who are Christian. So for every gay person out there, think that, you know, all oh, Christians all suck or whatever. It's, it's, it's just not true. And, and, and shouldn't be generalized like that. Just like gay people shouldn't all be generalized. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, I would, I would agree with you that there have been, uh, charlatans and there are charlatans and, and okay. So I, I told you this, um, the other day, whenever we've talked for like the first time on the phone, I told you that I'm passionate when I preach, but I'm compassionate when I talk to somebody because Kurt, the honest truth is I came to this. No, I, People aren't just born in this and know everything and live perfectly. We come to this. And so I don't always um, preach the same way, but there's uh, many times when I'm very passionate and intense and that offends people, not everybody. But there are people that get offended because I lift my voice and okay. And so here's here. And here's the deal. I know that that is not going to be received well by everyone. But if I am performing for people, then I'm not fulfilling the purpose that I have, I can't, I'm and I know the whole thing of politically correct or whatever. If I worry about, wait a minute, am I going to be within the realms of political correctness? I'm more concerned about how I'm performing than how I'm following the word of God or preaching the word of God. And so I'm not going to say that everybody that lifts their voice says the right thing, but why is it wrong for, I'll use me. Why is it wrong for me to lift my voice in the public square? But it's, it's wrong for me to, to be passionate. It's wrong for me to be whatever, you know, but it's not wrong for someone who isn't Christian to lift their voice about a cause or a purpose. If, if they're, if, and I'll just use an easy one, an abortion activist can get very intense, can be very passionate. You know, I mean, they can do all kinds of stuff. A BLM activist, a, it, it, there's so many examples where it's okay, but then, oh wait, there's that crazy Christian preacher. Okay, so, it, it, right. so it, if I can, I'm, I might be able to answer that for you. There isn't anything wrong with you being passionate. I get accused of the same thing, especially when my best friend, because we'll talk about topics. And he, and it's not that he disagrees with what I'm saying, but when he asks me something, I'll start talking and I get very passionate about it. And mm-hmm. it's not because he's in, and he goes, why are you raising your, I go, I'm just passionate. Like, I'm not even upset. I'm not mad. I'm just very passionate about whatever topic it is that I, that I get like that with. And so people misunderstand passion. Mm-hmm. It's not wrong to be passionate. It is not wrong to say what you have to say. I feel again, this is my personal opinion. Unless it has, unless you're what you're passionate about and what you're preaching is hatred. And that's not what I, that's not what I get from you. And, and I don't care if you're on the left side, the right side, I don't care if you belong to Antifa, BLM, if you're a, an abortion activist, if, if you if your whole purpose is to cause division and hatred, then you're, you're, you're not the messenger that should be speaking for that particular topic or that particular issue. If you're not able to be compassionate to the people that you're addressing I would say you probably need to take a step back and go, am I the person who should be delivering this message? Because 
again, regardless of what side you're on, is but in particular as a pastor, I that's why I wanted to talk to you because I felt like you did have compassion for the people you were talking to. You may not agree, and I even would I get a sense when you with you and I talking that you're compassionate to me. You don't agree with me. I'm compassionate to you. I don't agree with you, but I respect you. I understand where you're coming mm -hmm. from. And mm -hmm. and the chances are I would never ever agree with you. Chances are you'll never ever agree with me, but I can still respect you and still be compassionate towards you. I don't have to hate you. And this whole this mm -hmm. whole idea that we have to hate people that don't agree with us is ridiculous. And it's it's only come about, you know, in the past couple of decades where we started mm -hmm. acting and behaving this way. It's like if you're not with us, you're against this type of mentality. I won't tell you who said that first, but <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're aware. But anyway, it's that kind of mentality that hurts us because then we can't have open dialogue. And and one of the other things I want to tell you is that what makes it right and what makes it wrong is whether you're dishonest or not. And if you're being honest and you're coming from a place of honesty in your heart, I don't see the message is wrong. I Again, I don't have to agree with you, but I get why you're why that's your message and why you feel the need to to deliver mm -hmm. that message. And people that that it resonates with will be glad they heard it. People it doesn't, you don't, you know, it's like I, I can go, oh, there's that guy, you know, that crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But, that's yeah. that's still even being civil, actually. Right. Yeah, I mean, be, because and, and I'm not trying to cry in my milk here. But, you know, I, I, I shared with you um, that our church was vandalized. Um, the pictures, I don't know if you saw them, but. Yes, I did. I, and I, and okay. I want to say it, I do not I, agree with, look, I don't ever it, believe in violence unless it's met with violence. If, if someone yeah. comes at you with violence, then you have all the right in the world. But to vandalize someone just simply because they didn't like what you had to say. Yeah. I'm sorry. It, and that's not civil. That. And this is the truth before God. I mean this. I have never said we need to be violent against LGBTQ people. I have never tried to incite violence or hatred. What I have said is, here's what the scripture says. This is the way we should live. That's the beginning and the end of the story. And I have said, there are things that have been coming against our society. There's been things that's been coming against the family, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a spiritual warfare. And I do speak about warfare, spiritual warfare. I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking spiritual spiritual warfare. The Bible has a great deal to say about that. And, and, and the idea, okay, this is, this can be easily misunderstood. I don't believe that, that it is biblical to be a pushover. If, if you really believe you shouldn't be a pushover, that doesn't mean that you're arrogant and rude and like a snob but you have the conviction and you you live your conviction you speak your conviction so so this whole thing of cancel yes it just get you know snowflake is a pretty accurate it, it, it is but what i'll tell you is is that i find both the left and the right both using cancel culture, they're both crying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they both use the same tactics, and I, got to, yeah. you know, when yeah. is it ever going to stop with this nonsense? Yeah. seriously. So, like you and I are, I'm just going to say this: you are and I are an example on just a person to person basis of what we actually did at the rally because on the 20th of March, because here's what I did. When we started getting threats, I mean, literal physical threats to what we were going to be doing, um, I notified our mayor, I notified our police department. 
there were comments that said your police department will not be able to handle what's going to happen to you. So I shared this information with our mayor and with our police chief. They came, the, the, not the mayor, the, the police came. Thank God they came. I appreciate it. And you know what happened? The counter protest, the counter event that was completely a result of them becoming aware of our rally. They had have a gay day. Sandy, have a gay day. All right. That was their deal. Okay. They were across the street from us. Two different ideologies, two different viewpoints. We did not have violence. We did not have people that were attacking each other. I'm not going to say that there wasn't some verbal stuff that happened on the outskirts over there. It wasn't me. It wasn't the people in our congregation. Okay. There was some verbal exchange. But when I told you earlier that this lesbian woman came and stood in the front up there, she was not cussed out. She was not screamed at. She was not railed on. She wasn't accosted. She wasn't told, get out of here. We had civil interaction. And I posted afterwards, I said, I thank the police department. I said, our city has just become an example of what America is supposed to be, where you can have two different ideologies across the street. That's America. Right. You and I, th this is America. Thank God we can do this because it, you're going to influence people, Kurt. I'm going to influence people. I don't know who is going to be influenced by you or me, but we are blessed to be able to be doing what we're doing and having the, the rally thing. And, and so I say, why should we have this idea that nobody should be able to do that? No, let's do it. Let's embrace it and show that you can have opposite views, but you're civil. You're civil. I think because no matter what side you're on, if you let the other side speak, you're going to go, you know, people are going to see it for the, mess, the message for what it is. That's why with the West Barrow ba Baptist people, I said, let them speak. Because when people listen to them, they're going to know who and what they are mm -hmm. by their actions mm -hmm. and by their words. So you don't have to shut them down. If you shut them down, then what happens is people can only imagine what they're saying. And then they're going, oh, right. there must be something to it or else you wouldn't try to shut them down. You know, we have, you know, just you know, like with uh, gay pride parade and other events that we've had, you know, we always have the, you know, the people from, I don't know where they're from, to be honest. I don't want to say they're from some church or something, but yeah. like, bags yeah. are going to hell, you know, the, the, with the bill, with the uh, poster boards. Yeah. So, you know, you're going to have the counter, you know, um, rallies or to counter people who are going to stand across and, 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 you know, try to be seen or whatever to anything that we talk about. And I don't care. I guarantee you, if we talked about eating meat, vegans would out, be out there and you want to talk about a <laughs> group of people, they're meaner than anybody. <laughs> I'm, I've, I've spoken with some of them there. I go, you know, if you ate some meat, you wouldn't be so mean. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. <laughs> you know, but one of the things I have to address because yeah. and I think it was at this that this event that you're talking about, there were some proud boys there. And yeah. they were not following your message because they were out there giving the white power sign, the the flip the bird sign, and I'm sure yeah. of other signs. And yeah. they don't come there with love or compassion, they come there with hatred. And, and their message is, you know, is not the message that you're trying to put out there. And I think that, I think that hurts your message. I know you can't control who comes to your rallies, but would you, would you, um, would you call them out and say, listen, you don't speak to what the message that I'm delivering. Like, would you speak to a preacher who says that gay people should be stoned to death? Because there are preachers out there right now in this country that if it were legal would 
try to get a group of people to stone gay people to death. Would you would you stand up against him and 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 say, yeah, that's not right? Okay, so I would not condone stoning a gay person to death. Okay, because because here's here's what I'm supposed to do. I'm trying to I'm supposed to try to persuade, not intimidate. Now, some people may interpret my attempt to persuade as intimidation. I'm not being violent. I'm not inciting violence. I'm not condoning violence. So I would not go down the road of let's take and stone gays. Okay. On the issue of the Proud Boys, I will tell you, and I'm being honest about this. That was not the first rally that they came to. Okay. In that number, that was the biggest number that I recall them coming. But here's what really prompted that number to come, in my opinion. They were made aware of the threats that we were receiving. The threats, okay, I have thick skin. You probably have thick skin. I mean, you know, honest. And so there can be people that are, you know, like just keyboard warrior type deal. You know, okay. I'm not talking, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when people are saying to you, um, when when people are saying, we're gonna, we're gonna do harm to you. And it wasn't me going, hey, everybody, they're saying they're gonna hurt us. They were reading the same comments that I was reading. And so here is my understanding of their reasoning for coming. They wanted to stand to protect our First Amendment rights. I had them tell me, we don't necessarily agree with what you say, but we're here to make sure you can say it. I appreciated it. Now, I shook their hands. I said, thank you for coming. Not because of the, the other stuff, but specifically for their willingness to say, you have the right to do this. We're standing here so that you can know you're going to be able to do that. Because, and, and I'm not trying to diss on our police department. I am going to one comment in specific. When the dude said, Sandy PD will not be able to handle what's going to happen to you. Okay. So I, that, that's point number one. I didn't invite them. Was I aware that they were going to come? Yes. Did I send out a message for them to not come? No. Why? Because I appreciated their support for the First Amendment rights. If you had a coalition of gay men and lesbian women that said, Russell, we're going to come to your rally and stand there and make sure that you are protected. Your First Amendment right is protected to speak what you want to speak because there's been a threat from Muslims. Let's just use that as an example. I would shake your hand and I would say, thank you for standing here for our First Amendment rights. Okay, now that's that's point one. Point number two, even though they were standing on the fringe, they heard the message that I was preaching. And Jesus spoke to sinful people. He spoke to people that were broken and people that were messed up. And so in my mind as a pastor, I'm saying they need to hear the word of God just like anyone else. I did not endorse the symbols and the words and I mean, I can't, that, 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 that stuff was, while I'm over here preaching, that's going on over there. I didn't coordinate that. I didn't instigate that. Okay. So did it bring a negative to the event? It would be uh, wrong for me to say no, but did it bring also in a sense, a positive, it would be wrong for me to say no, because it did. And in, in this aspect, 
that they said, we want to stand here for your First Amendment rights. And I appreciated that. And I welcomed it. And so it, it, is, a, it is a complex circumstance when you have people that not every proud boy is a person that would be the same as what people may view proud boys as you may not be like every person's view of gay every person is <laughs> every person is an individual right and and and, and so i i'm i'm trying to put them on this on an equal opportunity to need to hear God's word just like anybody else. So I don't know if that's if I'm answering that, that answers it perfectly. Actually I you know it, because it comes down to this. I understand what you just said and I and I understand why you allowed allowed it to happen and 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 it's it's reasonable. So I guess the only thing that would really to to ease people's mind is is that the, you know which I already know that you do but it, it, it's like you had them there because they were they were willing to say look we want to make sure you have the right to speak you know and and have your first amendment right so i guess what people want to know is is like okay if you allow them there for that reason but can you say i condemn racism i condemn hatred of any kind i you know it like those things that they might stand for but you go look i didn't have them there for that that i didn't you know i didn't shake their hand because of that i'm against those things if you, you know, i think if people would be or they should be if you can say i condemn those things regardless of who believes in them so you brought you you mentioned this at the very beginning that in the different rallies that we had we addressed different subject matters and one of those rallies was specifically the way to heal racism we spoke that entire rally about racism why it's wrong why god does not endorse racism so we had a whole rally devoted to that subject matter so yes i stand against racism i come from the south i was raised in texas i've been in oregon like i don't know 27 to 28 years, somewhere in that neighborhood. In the sixth grade, I was segregated. Blacks, whites, Mexicans. It, excuse me, not segregated. I used the wrong word. We were segregated. We desegregated. We integrated. Sorry. <laughs> so, so, so that we were bust. We were bust together. Okay. From the sixth grade to the 12th grade, I went to school with whites, blacks, Mexicans. Now, that doesn't sound odd today, but back then, it was a gigantic deal. People were, like, freaking out. Okay, so as a kid, though, you just start going to school, right? And you start developing relationships, and you start learning how to get along with people that are not like you. And by the time that I graduated, I had dear friends that were black, Mexican, white. In my wedding, not my best man, but the next guy over, black. My wife had a Cuban in her side. You know what I'm saying? The church that I pastor is multiracial. We have Filipino. We have people of Hispanic descent. We have people that are mixed, black and white. So they're uh, biracial. OK, we have whites. I I have preached. We don't have them here now, but we had a family that came here for years that was Spanish speakers. They had a very, very hard time with English. I preached bilingual for years. I am not in support of racism. Excellent. End of story. That's and that's what should count, you know, and in and in, in I you know, I applaud you for that. I have to say, and this is going to be sound wrong. Is your is is, is the Filipino you have? I see you have um, a drum set or a musical. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Sing because I swear every Filipino I ever met can sing. <laughs> 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 they have the most amazing voice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I I'm really glad that we had this discussion, and yeah, I I feel like you know you're sincere in who you are and you're honest with, with your message. And again, whether I agree with it or not, mm-hmm. I know that it, I don't believe it comes from a place of hatred. I hope that both sides can understand your side, my side, that, that we can have dialogue like this yeah. you and I can yes. out and have lunch together and have a good time and still be friends and still, and, and be okay with having our difference of opinions, you know, and, and, um, I, I hope that you know society gets back to that where we we're not so polarized where everything is about life or death. You know, it's like mm-hmm. oh you don't you, you know, like oh you you read Harry Potter books oh you're the worst <laughs> you're done <laughs> you know sort of thing or whatever ridiculous argument we can find and we can find anything so you know to argue yeah. so I really yeah. I, I appreciate everything. Did you have any? any parting words that you'd like to say okay i appreciate you inviting me the the challenge that we face every day is just being able to be honest because there's so much fear kurt if i'm really who i am you know, I'm going to get, you know, targeted. And and I will say one of the most liberating things for myself is having come to the point of saying, this is what I believe. I believe the scripture. I genuinely believe it. I genuinely want to live it. I genuinely want to share it. And the reason that we are able to be civil with each other is because of this thing you brought up compassion. I believe we're supposed to be compassionate. That's what Christ was, is. And so I would say end of story here is thanks because we have been civil to each other. We should be civil to each other. We should be civil, compassionate, and be able to say, I speak this because this is what I believe, and here's why I believe it. And then, you know, you can walk away at least knowing, right? At, at least, at least knowing that guy's being honest, you know? Well, I'd like to add something to what you just said. And this is to everybody out there, whether you agree with Russell, whether you agree with me, whether you don't agree with either one of us or whatever. Yeah. If you if you can't be compassionate towards the people that you are addressing, then you're in the wrong. I don't care what side you think you're on. I don't care if you think that your side's right, you're wrong. Because if you, if you have no compassion or love for the person you're talking to, then there's a problem and it's, it's you honestly. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a gentleman who I just adore. His name is Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. And he said something that that you know stuck with me, you know, for the past. Well, I mean, I've I've known it, but when you hear a man like him say it, it, it just like resonated resonated with me. He said, "Don't ever, ever, ever compromise your integrity." Mm-hmm. And I think that if we can be honest, and I, I've said this a few times, if you can't be honest with yourself, you can't be honest with anyone else. And mm-hmm. if you're doing things that compromise your integrity, you're not being honest. How can you be honest with anyone else? How can you have a discussion with anyone else when you can't, you can't have it with your, with yourself. So mm-hmm. if you're having a problem with people, you might want to look inside and see where, if it, that problem lies with you. So yeah. thank All you right. so much. <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Russell, take care folks. Thanks for joining us. I, I hope you enjoyed this as, as much as uh, I did. And I hope Russell enjoyed it as well. And uh, until next time, take care, be safe. And as of still right now, wear your mask. <laughs>